SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952, and by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy. On tonight's SoCal Connected, marijuana is legal in California but the pot shop you buy from may not be. The illegal market uh, outscales our legal one probably four or five times. And its product could actually be toxic. The samples are failing miserably. These are above my calibrations. That's how, that's how dirty these are. Why won't the city stop the poison pot pipeline? It doesn't look like a war zone, but this ancient redwood forest conceals a dark secret. It's where a long-running battle still rages, a battle against forces that could destroy its very existence. This rugged remote woodland is called the Emerald Triangle. Humboldt, Trinity, and Shasta counties, emerald, not only for nature's green, but also for the cash that this land creates. Cash from the region's top crop, cannabis, illegally grown cannabis that was supposed to be weeded out when marijuana was legalized three years ago. These millions of acres of dense forests continue to create a perfect hiding place for a poisonous pot pipeline. A pipeline that's delivering death and destruction every day here. These scientists are trying to stop it. Scientist can't go out without his pencil. That's Ecologists Greta Wengert yeah, and Marad Gabriel are the co-directors of the nonprofit Integral Ecology Research Center. Good morning, Marad. Good morning, Detective. Good to see you. Pretty good. How are you yeah, doing? Good, good. You guys ready to uh, go through the briefing and all that? Few know more about the environmental impacts of illegal marijuana grows. Today, they are in Trinity County. Their plan is to investigate a trespass grow. In other words, an illegal site. In the Shasta Trinity National Forest, it's one of 170 they plan to reclaim by the end of 2019. There's a girl on this side of the ridge, there's a girl a little bit on the top, and then it just kind of goes like this from the ridge, you know, like they normally do, and just kind of. The site was discovered by the U.S. Forest Service in 2017 and shut down. The team believes it might be active again. Many of the sites hidden on public lands here are run by Mexican drug cartels. Some return, betting the police won't catch them twice. Growers are often armed. Gabriel and his team will only inspect the site with a law enforcement escort. Nate is the lead today because this site can be potentially active. So if Nate says, be quiet, we all need to be quiet. If Nate says, shut up, then we shut up. Much of the Shasta Trinity National Forest is inaccessible by car. This is one of the few roads in and out. Grow site the team is tracking is in a remote part of the forest on a mountainside. The climb gets steeper, the view more beautiful. The road finally gone. I have the escape keys with me, so go ahead and lock it up when you guys are done. Copy, we are in route. Only 100 feet down the ridge, the searchers discover the first piece of evidence of the illegal grow site. There's rubber piping leading to the water source used to irrigate the plants. This is the water cistern that they will use as sort of a holding tank for the source. 
as you saw as we were walking in, Ivan was pulling up this line from beneath the ground. And basically that's probably coming from a water source somewhere over there. We haven't identified it yet. So if we follow that water pipe, you'll go right to it, Greta, but I think we'll just cut down here and try to get out of the brush. Okay. Two years after the supposed shutdown, an entire drainage system is still in place. All this was marijuana because everywhere I look, I'm seeing these emitters. So there's one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. So this was all marijuana where I'm seeing. So that's two, four, six, eight, ten. So there's ten plants here. If each plant produces a half a pound, that's not an exaggeration. Half a pound is really considered a very conservative estimate. But let's say ten pounds, half a pound, that's five pounds just in this little area. Now go another probably... 300 feet or one football field worth. This is how far and wide it went that way. This site is just a few hundred feet off the road, but some locations are five, six, even 10 miles deep into the forest. Growers hike in and lay hundreds of feet of irrigation lines and steal water from nearby creeks and rivers. Trees are cleared to make room for sunshine. They like remote areas with good water and good sunlight exposure. Gabriel is at another site 400 feet away. Hey, Krat. Yeah. Did you document this fertilizer down below us? This would be considered a small camp, probably two to four people. It's organized. This is not something that you and I are trying to coordinate with some high school friends. This is organized crime. This is very organized. Growers ransack the land. They left garbage and insecticide bottles scattered everywhere. It's something Gabriel and his team have seen dozens of times at remote sites throughout California. Some growers are prepared to spend months tending to the cannabis plants, squatting on the public's dime. At a reclamation event in May 2019, five miles of irrigation lines and three tons of trash were hauled out by law enforcement and Gabriel himself. Okay, we got three nets there. Oh my. It took three days and thousands of dollars to clear the site. Ultimately, taxpayers are stuck with the bill. The team was able to hike into this site, but to inspect remote areas, they often have to use helicopters. It's very remote territory. It's just inherently hazardous to deal with. That's why they put the grows there, you know, because it's hard to get to. It's free land. There's no rent, there's no mortgage, there's no water bill, there's no power bill, there's no trash bill. And once they use it for what they want and they get their product out, all of this is left behind for the public to come clean up. There's one trash pile here, there's a trash pile up there, the reservoir, and you can see the irrigation line that's gonna go here, and I guess, uh, oh, we got a bottle of carboferin. Okay, let's go, Hold Right on. there. Hold on. I just okay. saw that right now. Look at that right there. Are you serious? Seriously. Carboferin is a banned pesticide. Okay, so this is it's been compared to a chemical weapon because it's so deadly. Yeah, it like a... This bottle was made in Mexico. It's already been eaten by wildlife. So wildlife already punctured. There's a bear puncture here. So that bear is done with. This, is, this one's at 66%. So that's a pretty significant concentration. Back in 2012, Gabriel and Wingert found carbofurin at 15% of trespass growth. Now it's more like 85%. That bottle can kill us, all of us here, probably about 10 times. We don't need to test this to know that this is absolutely carboferin. So I'd say, I don't know what, Ivan, maybe one out of every 10 sites we go to has an actual bottle. It's even less common at a site that's over two years old. Yeah. Once it's in the soil, carboferin can stay there for months. Illegal growers use it to kill rodents and wildlife. To me, it's pretty frustrating because I grew up here. Fertilizers, poisons, anything that is left, um, basically the the wildlife here just kind of scavenges through it and spreads it all throughout the watershed here. Um, it's got a huge impact. It's not just wildlife at risk. During an eradication event in El Dorado National Forest in 2018, 
Six members of a team were sickened and one temporarily blinded when they came in contact with the pesticide. Pesticides are what got Gabriel and Wingert involved in all of this. Ten years ago, they discovered Pacific fishers, a mammal similar to a honey badger, were dying at an alarming rate. Fishers lived deep in the forest. What was killing them? Pesticides. The fishers ate meat poisoned by illegal growers who wanted to keep wildlife away from their plants. It was hard evidence that black market grows were now in the most remote corners of the forest. Since then, the ecologists have spent most of their working lives documenting the environmental impacts of trespass grows. It hasn't made them popular in the Emerald Triangle. When Murad first started raising very serious concerns about these rodenticide impacts and fisher populations and basically the explosion of the weed industry, people started getting angry at him. And um, it wasn't long after that his family dog was poisoned. They got death threats, you know. Um, and when you're dealing with an industry that has, again, enormous profits associated with illegal activity, um, there are people who are going to protect those profits. The growers out there are, are highly armed. That is the risk. I mean, that's the risk not, not scientists, but law enforcement does to clean up our grow sites or enforce. So no one does that. I mean, that's the risk. A lot of those folks are doing it every day, every year for decades. One of the people who take those risks is Trinity County Sheriff Tim Saxon. Good luck, guys. Thanks, Scott. If you took the state of Rhode Island, doubled it, Trinity County's still a little bit bigger. Population-wise, uh, we're a little under 14,000 for the county. Cannabis cultivation has really blossomed in an area like this, primarily because we have nearly 80% public lands that we're not able to patrol on a regular basis. Many growers operate legal marijuana farms up here, but doing it right can cost six figures in licensing, testing, and fees, not to mention the months of bureaucratic red tape. Some are choosing to go underground, especially the cartels. We have seen an increase in the number of uh, what we determine have been cartel grows. And we also know that there's human trafficking going on related to the cartels. They're, in essence, uh, bringing slave labor from other parts of, of the world. Trespass grows extend well beyond the Emerald Triangle, from a public park in Orange County to remote parts of Santa Barbara. The California Attorney General's Office has the largest illegal marijuana eradication program in the nation. This year, the program destroyed nearly a million marijuana plants from 345 raided grow sites. The poisonous pot pipeline continues to flow. Some of that contaminated weed is ending up in Los Angeles, where illegal pot shops far outnumber licensed ones. How much are these cartridges? The pink one, these ones or these ones? Mm, so you get $10 grams. SoCal Connected went undercover, shopping at 11 illegal dispensaries and delivery services across LA. We purchased 36 products, everything from joints to vape cartridges. So these are edibles, one gram of inner chi. We got a cartridge, moon rock. This resin is called AK-47. 50 milligrams of a brownie. pH Solutions. A state-certified lab agreed to test them for SoCal Connected. Dr. Raquel Collegian is the lab director. These were samples brought in by um, KCET from various locations. Before she even opened the products, she noticed problems. It has to be in childproof packaging and it has to be in a tamper-proof package. There is no labels for dependency. There is nothing tracing this sample back to where it came from who distributed it, and it does not have the total milligrams per package. That makes it impossible to know how much THC you're consuming or where it was grown. But what really troubled her? What was inside the packaging? 
50% of the samples that were brought to us by KCET failed for pesticide. Collegian tested our samples for 66 different pesticides and four heavy metals. Nearly every dispensary we visited had a product that failed the test. One vape cartridge purchased from a delivery service had a particularly toxic brew. This failed for biphenazate. Threshold for biphenazate is 0.1. This failed at 4.2. It failed for fipronil, which is a category one pesticide, at 0.4. And it failed for mycobutanol at 133 ppm. And the threshold is 0.1. Mycobutanol is a fungicide that helps reduce mildew. A small amount is allowed on crops. It becomes hazardous when it's smoked or inhaled because it can produce toxic fumes like hydrogen chloride. When it was found in legal weed two years ago in Canada, there was a recall. A pre-rolled joint given as a new customer freebie by Culver City Healing, had over 3,000 times the legal amount of mycobutanol in it. That same joint also failed for five other pesticides. I mean, there was so much mycobutanol on this particular sample, you would think that it was accidentally poured into it. I mean, this is a lot. Trace amounts of carbofurin were found in edible gummies we purchased at Beverly Medical Collective in Koreatown. And listen to what was in this vape cartridge, called Asian Fantasy, we bought from another delivery service. That one failed from mercury, and we rarely see a mercury failure. It's supposed to be 0.1, and it's at 0.14, but do you want to be inhaling mercury? As of the end of November, the Centers for Disease Control has attributed at least 47 deaths and more than 2,000 severe lung injuries to vaping. I think that the recent issue that we are seeing in, in the news with the vaping is an acute toxicity, meaning it's right away. Whatever is happening is not over a long period of time. It's where whatever we're seeing is right away. And that's why I feel it's so important to make the testing as rigorous as it is so that we can possibly pinpoint maybe it's one thing, maybe it's a combination of things. Collegian normally only tests legal products. She was disturbed by how badly our products fared. These are failing miserably. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no calibration issue. There's no, um, I accidentally picked it, or maybe it could be noise. These are above my calibrations. That's how, that's how dirty these are. The products bought at MCC 25 cap all passed, but that was the exception. We contacted nearly all of the other businesses that sold failed products. They were surprised by the results. They also claimed they were licensed, which is not true. None are. In fact, two stores, MCC 25 Cap and Green Door, both in North Hollywood, were closed by the LAPD in the spring, according to city records. As of December, they are back in business. How much poisonous pot is for sale is anyone's guess. Police departments we spoke with in LA and Orange County don't typically test cannabis seized at illegal shops. However, in 2019, the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office purchased and tested products from this illegal commercial cannabis business in South LA. The test revealed that the product contained a chemical uh, that is used on golf courses to thicken the turf. And for me, this is a public health issue at the end of the day. Uh, and there is no reason why in California today anybody should be risking their health by buying product from a location that isn't properly licensed. Again, because only the licensed locations are required to test their product. Fewer is seeking an injunction against the business, but there are hundreds more out there, dwarfing store owners who are playing by the rules. The illegal market outscales our legal one probably four or five times. Jerry Kylo owns a licensed dispensary in Sherman Oaks. At one point, he says there were so many illegal shops in the area, he hired a full-time employee just to track and report them to the city. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It is. But if you're gonna protect your market share and you're gonna protect your place in this industry, unfortunately, it's what you have to do. With so many illicit shops masquerading as legal, what's a consumer supposed to do? There's no scarlet letter on the wrong ones, right? I think if there was some sort of big, you know, maybe the city can just go around and spray paint each of the doors and say, this is a bad one. So we have no list of those that are not licensed because by definition, they're operating underground. I will tell you that in the last year and a quarter or so, um, our office has brought 
more than 350 cases involving nearly 1,400 defendants, and we've closed more than 150 illegal locations, with many more in the criminal justice pipeline. Legal stores must have a license number posted. But a city official told us sometimes illicit shops post fake licenses, confusing consumers even more. We all have license search on our public website that you can search to see if somebody's legal or not. Easier said than done. To operate legally in L.A., a business needs to be licensed by the city and the state. This is the website for the state's Bureau of Cannabis Control. Typing in the business name doesn't always work. Now just run the name of the company. They're not there. <laughs> Does that... No, it's... So, how... It... I don't... I, can you just double check this so you don't see New Amsterdam? Maybe it's Amsterdam Naturals? Some illegal operators change their names, and the storefront doesn't necessarily match the company that actually owns the dispensary. Since the site wasn't much help, our producer called the state hey, to get uh, some answers. I wondering if you could help me. I'm just trying to uh, find out if a couple shops uh, here in Los Angeles are legal. Just because it doesn't come up, it may still be legal. Oh, I did go to the website, but I was getting conflicting information on it. They could be legal under the city, but not yet legal under the state. So they're not licensed. This, this is really confusing. The state is spending $1.7 million on an advertising campaign called WeedWise to direct people to the site. A big goal is to really educate consumer of why it's important to go to the legal market. Educating consumers may be the least of the agency's problems. In July 2019, a highly critical state audit of the Bureau was released. Among the findings, there are only five investigators for the entire state. There's a backlog of over 2,400 complaints. Revenue from applications and fees have been more of a bust than a boom for the Bureau. An estimated $201 million was supposed to be collected through June 30th, 2019. It ended up being $16 million, according to a bureau spokesperson. And statewide, the pot windfall hasn't materialized either. One reason for all of this? Taxes. The products we bought were at least half the price than that licensed store. I know that one gram cartridges in the vaping right now, you can buy for eight to $10. I sell mine for 60. Kylo pays a tax rate of almost 50%. Um, first, you have a cultivation tax, and depending on the municipality, it can be anywhere from 2% up to like 8%. So to transport it from your farm to a processing plant, there's a tax and a fee there. A distributor has a distribution tax as well, as well as fees on top of that. So the retailer has to pay uh, a 15% excise tax to the state, a gross receipts tax, and then a sales tax on top of that. On average, especially in the city of Los Angeles, you're at about a 47% tax rate from pretty much seed to sale. And there is more to pay. As of January 2020, another state tax on cannabis kicks in. It seems Prop 64, the law that made marijuana legal, unintentionally promotes the very thing it was trying to stop, the black market. But the illegal pot shop problem is nothing new to Los Angeles. We reported on it 10 years ago. Why doesn't the city just come and shut this place down? Uh, that is the $64,000 question. Well, there's a billion dollar question, right? Like, why are they still allowed to operate? Let's start to put different levies and fines on them to say it's financially not rewarding to go ahead and take the risk. Well, but look, this is like any criminal enterprise. You know, it doesn't matter what the nature of the crime is, if you shut it down in one location, it is possible it might emerge someplace else. Um, but we're taking every step we can to diminish the likelihood that that happens. A big part of the problem? There aren't enough licensed stores to meet demand. In the city of LA, there are just 189 legal businesses to serve a population of 4 million. The city's Department of Cannabis Regulation is currently in the process of awarding 100 more licenses to the 1,600 people who qualify, but the process has been beset by problems. Lakeisha Carter and her husband have applied to open a business through the city's social equity program. We have been in this process for about a year now. We sent our application in. They approved our application. It was time for us to go find a building to locate, to start running a business. But then we have all those illegal stores that stopped us from opening a legal store because all of the locations that they allowed us to 
um, run legal stores were saturated with the illegal stores. When the city's Department of Cannabis Regulation opened last year, it employed just three full-time staff members. Its commission is supposed to meet twice a month. As of November, they've canceled 23 out of their 34 meetings. Every time we try to get a meeting, it's always canceled. We have no answers. No one wants to talk to us. Why all those canceled meetings? I'm not aware of uh, the fact that I don't, under, I don't know why they've been canceled. Uh, something we can get back to on. I have no idea where it relates to the scheduling. And I'll pass on the concern about meetings being rescheduled. Cat Packer, director of the city's cannabis department, declined comment. A spokesperson stated a quorum of commissioners could not be established and there was no business for the commission to consider. Meanwhile, L.A. is struggling with an explosion of illegal pot shops. There are some challenges that are being presented, of course. This is a brand new economy. Be patient with the city. Um, we, we have the funding in place to hire the folks necessary. There's going to be growing pains. There's going to be a lot of frustration. Nobody's more frustrated than, than, than I am, but I am determined to do my job to ensure that we're going to get a handle on this industry and it'll be a model for the rest of the country. SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952, and by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill philanthropy.